Thanks for tuning into our podcast. I refuse to say the name out loud. This is Dion. And this is Anniki. Our podcast is two degenerate furries who happen to live together, turning their normal rants and trailing off into a premier listening experience about design. Content! For the masses. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare for some spicy hot takes and some absolutely Antarctic ones. We hope you enjoy our general sense of laxness and crust. We're doing this all pretty much spur of the moment and there's gonna be some mess. Some mess. A lot of mess. <laughs> First annual weekly, bi weekly, monthly. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, the topic of today is game feel. What's like the first example of like a game feel that you either didn't notice or you particularly did notice how good it felt? Like just the correlation between doing the action as the player and then how it feels in game. Honestly, uh, lately I've been having a really hard time with uh, parsing game feel because I think I've just gotten so used to the idea of how certain genres of games make a game feel that my brain's just immediately like in that mindset, not thinking about it. But reaching far back, I have to say stuff like, dude, Vanquish had really particular game feel. Resident Evil 4 obviously has really particular game feel. And then there are some games that just feel like... Kind of mushy and not there. Yeah, I think game feel is one of those uh, one of those key parts of that whole video games as an experience thing that you and I love so much. It's like if you nail that, that's like <laughs> half of it. <laughs> You're yeah. already like in there. <laughs> You are already in the video game. I think Journey is another one of those examples. I don't know if you ever played it. Yeah, yeah, I played that with you, and I think I played it like three times after you showed it to me. <laughs> that's one of those games that's like, it's all game feel. Like, it's a glorified walking simulator, basically, but you still have such a good game feel that it doesn't matter that it's a glorified walking simulator. It doesn't matter that there's no actual dialogue in the story. It doesn't matter if there's no text either. It's just, this feels nice. It feels good to move around in. It feels good to like, I say play, but it's not really a game in that same aspect. It's just... It's definitely the first go-to for video games as an experience. I think that's sort of... That phrase has replaced video games as art for me because of... Is it Outer Wilds or Outer Worlds? <laughs> I can never tell the difference. <laughs> Who the fuck decided those both needed to come out in the same time frame almost? Yeah, I don't know. Do you mean the one where you are a space explorer that was cryogenically frozen? Or do you mean the one where you are a space explorer who is stuck in a spoiler? The second one, I'm pretty sure. The, okay. The good feel one. Okay, yeah. You know, either or makes a decent compelling argument for why you can't just say video games as art is a good thing. Because I feel like Outer Worlds, <laughs> the, the Obsidian video game, is very much a good case for video games are art, but it is a very bad case for video games as an experience. Because yeah. it has a lot of really good art in it. It has a very particular feel to it. I don't think they're good. <laughs> I did like the style of it just at first glance. It looked like future Fallout done like, I don't know, better than Fallout's been doing. <laughs> yeah. You have to also consider that one of the Fallout games is just an Obsidian experience. Yeah. And I think Outer Worlds looks better than Fallout 4 did as far as, I don't know, it came out later. But as far as, like, just the aesthetic, just getting that across. Just not using the same goddamn engine. <laughs> yeah, we, we can talk forever about... Yeah, you got a point. <laughs> Bethesda's engine problems and the bugs and the... Oops, I, there I am talking about it. <laughs> um, I think that one was Outer Wilds, right? Or Worlds. Outer Worlds. That's, that's the, the Fallout <laughs> one, right? Yes. Okay, Outer Wilds. <laughs> That one is one that they, like, 
it was amazing that like slow realization of holy shit this is an experience that kind of blew me away because journey had that same kind of thing but i feel like it was less like obvious with journey but some of the design aspects of outer wilds when i thought about them as like mechanics and from a creative perspective i was like holy shit that's cool (laughs) yeah just as far as like being the developer who sits there at the keyboard and has to think up those mechanics and how to utilize them in a way that like makes sense for the story that you're getting across and the, the gameplay world that you're generating and they're technically fundamental laws of that game's universe yeah so you've You've almost, like, reached this perfect peak of, you know, game mechanics and game experience melding into one thing. They're, they might not be used in a bunch of extremely varied scenarios as far as, like, when you find a mechanic, you maybe you only really use that idea once or twice. But when it is used, it's incredible. Yeah, I think... I've been realizing a lot lately that just in general how relative everything can be. Um, There's a video I watched that got me thinking about like video game hubs versus immersion or HUDs versus immersion. And the idea that they break immersion isn't something I totally agree with. But when you see examples of video game HUDs that integrate themselves directly into the game or you don't notice them, I'm like... Holy shit, that's cool. It's not like the other one is bad, but like there's so many different things you can do with game feel to just make a wilder, deeper experience. It's weird and wild. I love it. (laughs) On the topic of HUDs, I would argue that a HUD is basically just, it's what you get when you play any kind of video game. In the terms of, say, Assassin's Creed, the HUD is very much like what would be displayed by the Animus if you want to, like, think about it in-universe. Yeah. So, the HUD exists in-universe, technically. And then you have things like, say, any any RPG, where you have a health bar. It's like, <laughs> that's not technically immersive at all, but it's information you need to know, and it's not 100% always conducive to the player to just be like, I'm limping, that's how much health I have. Sometimes you need a little bit more detail, sometimes you need something that's a little bit more vague. I personally prefer a percent over just like a bar or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the idea that HUDs break immersion in general is wild to me because I have never at any point in my life thought, look at that health bar in the corner of the screen. That's not realistic. (laughs) Yeah. I've seen games that have done it differently and thought, oh shit, that's a cool immersive way to do it, but I never popped in an RPG. It gave me the information for health that I needed to know and thought, I don't know how much HP I've gotten real life. (laughs) Yeah. That's dumb. There's no there's no real argument that can be made for HUDs giving you information that you just have to have. Like, I haven't made the video yet, but in the example of Gun Griffin Blaze, you are piloting a mech, yeah. right? So your HUD is the different parts of the mech that display that, that information. That's cool. You could at least implement your HUD in a way that makes universal sense. Or sense in universe. Yeah. And that's great. But there's also information in the HUD that is not represented by stuff that is just part of the mech's layout. And that's fine, too. As long as it's not, like, tonally or stylistically different. If you make it mesh, people typically, I don't think, are going to notice. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're not really going to care that much. I think if I were going to approach game design myself from, like any perspective i think it's directly from how does this feel because i think game feel is like the core no matter if you're writing because i think that technically can qualify as game feel in a way but if it's writing or if it's direct mechanics or the information you're getting if it either feels so good that you do notice it or it just feels so un- unobtrusive that you don't that's what i think i would be trying to aim for yeah as long as it's not counterproductive or counterintuitive you don't really have a problem it's it's just kind of there yeah some people will always be like look at spyro and how spyro does the health as far as like it's your dragonfly and it changes colors or whatever and you can still make arguments on why that's bad like 
it moves around the screen. Uh, some people are colorblind. Like, you could make so many different arguments for why that's not accessible. But people still look at that as like, look at how immersive that is. And I'm like, is it really? Yeah. I, I realize now that we just got away from game feel into, like, game HUDs because of that. But at the same time, <laughs> it is kind of game feel. It gave, I, I think it directly relates to, like, that's the... That's the first thing you get when you are looking at Game Feel is what is on the screen. <laughs> yeah, I think it being reliable is important because uh, the Spyro thing just made me think about everyone was talking shit on uh, Guilty Gear Strive's... I think it was the burst, whichever has like the character icon that moves with the health. Right. Everyone was fucking pissed about that. And at first I was thinking, well, why is the same information you get? You look up to see the health, there's the burst. But then people started pointing out it's because they don't have a reliable spot in the heat of this fight that they know that information is. And they have to scan for that specific information if that's the information they're looking for. And that's when it clicked to me. I was like, oh shit, you're right. (laughs) A lot of that stuff is you need it kind of immediately. And there could be arguments for, oh, it's part of the game feel to not make it immediately available. And I have to say, that's stupid because it's your health bar. (laughs) Yeah, that don't feel good. (laughs) It it sure is game feel, but... (laughs) (laughs) But I also do like... We're still on HUDs here, but (laughs) I I do like, say, Dead Space, where look at how much of that HUD is just part of Isaac's back. Yeah, I think that was one of the examples in the video I watched. I think it was a Polygon video. They, They brought that up specifically, and the developers were talking about how they had a technically in canon reason for it, like, so that other people could see... If this person was in danger, because the suits were made for, I don't know, some space maintenance kind of thing. Yeah. And I think it's cool that they even tried to do that, but I think it's way cooler that they were like, here's a integrated health bar. Don't think about it. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, it's background noise and information after the fact. Yeah. But getting back into game feel, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac fucking stomping on stuff. Ooh. Feels real good. Meaty. It's, it's, it's meaty, it's chonky, it's got that sploosh. The the way Isaac just yells when he stomps, like, yeah! Ah! And he's just beating the crap out of whatever it is. That's so indicative of a one-to-one player response <laughs> of, like, you're fucking horrified, and here comes this monster, and you kill it, barely. You're like... I'm going to stomp on this now. And you just keep pressing the button and Isaac yells, that feels real good. That feel real great. Oh, I'm trying to think of some more examples kind of like that because I know I've felt things like that. There's been some hack and slash examples, but I can't think of any particular ones. I know Devil May Cry is pretty good at the way enemies are stunned by your attacks, at least the reaction time and the, you know, specifically exact frames that they're stunned. That's always stood out to me as like, oh shit, you can feel like directly how staggered the enemy is through your hit. And that makes the whole like, the whole style behind Devil May Cry feel so immediately intuitive because combos are the thing. Style is the thing. And so when you feel how much time you got until the next, you know, enemy can dodge or block or whatever, then you know when you can hit a button, and that feels good. And to piggyback off of that, in Devil May Cry, there's a very clear indication of, like, when an enemy is powerful because they won't be hit-stunned by insignificant attacks. (laughs) Yeah, I sure do. (laughs) (laughs) So... That's something they've very clearly thought about. And you can point to him and be like, that, that's game feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't think it jives with me specifically, but I like it as a mechanic in general. I'm too fucking unga bunga for it. I think both in 5 and 4, those enemies that like rage out and then they flail shit everywhere and you can't hit them. They got no hit stun in that state. Oh, those beat my ass. Because <laughs> I know I can stop... And I could be like, okay, dodge, guard, something. 
But my brain is like, I just hit a slash and I'm not gonna not slash. <laughs> yeah, I, I think learning those enemies, it's it's getting into the mentality of either Nero or Dante or whatever. And just thinking, okay, how is this enemy predictable? Yeah. And then from there being like, okay, I know how to dodge and or block this. And I think that the only reason those probably didn't jive with me specifically is because Devil May Cry at first... Hopping in on easy, you're encouraged to just mash, hack, and slash. Go unga bunga as hell. I didn't get out of that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think it took like quite a few playthroughs of Devil May Cry 3 for me to finally go, Oh, I'm supposed to think when I press buttons? <laughs> <sighs> But that's that's its own good game feel, too. Yeah, that's why it took me, like, two or three years to finally start thinking about, oh, this is how you play fighting games. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, in the example of Devil May Cry, and, and in some fighting games that are newbie-friendly, they let you pick somebody, or they let you play in a certain way, that lets you get accustomed to the mechanics without having to really learn the meat of them. Yeah. And that's, it's such an educated decision as far as knowing that your players will be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's fun to plan around from a developer perspective. Like, that's something I've always, or not always, but recently been considering a lot as far as ideas I would like to implement in a game someday. Something with fighting games. Something's gotta be done about fighting games. <laughs> because nobody yet has found a cohesive way to teach just about anyone to play. And that's been obvious to me because it took me like two years to get to a moderate standpoint. <laughs> Even playing fighting games, which I know have bases that are a little more, uh, we're getting into ease of learning instead of game feel. God again, damn it. But uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, even, even getting into those games, my brain was like, I need to learn the timing of combos. I need to learn enemy matchups. I need to learn positioning. My brain was not just, I will press button now. It's kind of a weakness of every fighting game because i was playing i think it was mortal kombat and injustice which are very similar games don't tell me they're not they are those that still took me about two weeks to get like decent at yeah but once i did get decent at it i was at the point of where my friend who had been playing it for three years was so it took me not that long to learn it compared to other fighting games. Yeah. But it still had that grind of getting anywhere. And then it didn't have a high skill ceiling. So it was ultimately instead of a game that is easy to learn, hard to master, it was just a game with a very shallow learning curve. Yeah, I think that actually would help a lot with fighting games, but is also very difficult to do with fighting games. Because Lord knows, <laughs> uh, fighting game players that, you know, are real deep in the meat, they don't like it when it's too easy. <laughs> Yeah. And I can get that, because if you spend years honing your craft, and then someone's like, here's Baby's first fighting game. It's the newest thing. Everyone you know is playing it. You're going to be like, hmm, I really would rather challenge myself. <laughs> When I first got into Guilty Gear, I was like, holy shit, Gatling mechanics. This makes sense. Mm, so good. I heard they're taking it out of Strive, and I don't like that. I didn't at first... And I can't quite explain it, but I can at least tell you from, like, uh, playing the beta, Gatling is gone, but things combo weirdly almost as satisfyingly. I was pulling off combos just from, you know, testing the moves and really quickly learning, like, when I could do other moves. I don't know how exactly. Daisuke just fucking... It hit it on the head this time, I guess. <laughs> but I was picking it up really, really fast. Faster than XR, and I don't think it was because I played so much XR. Because, I mean, it's a new game. Gatling's gone. I still got Gunflame and Fafnir, but they feel different. And I can combo them way different. It's... There's something about it that combos click, and you learn it fast, so you forget about Gatling. <laughs> I can understand that, but... 
from a beginner standpoint, it's so easy to just tell somebody. If you press the buttons in this order from light to heavy, it combos every time. Yeah. There's something really fucking easy about learning that. Yeah, I think that definitely does help. And I think that's a real nice beginner help tool. Hopefully whatever magic power his Daisuke used to make combos feel good, hopefully he can explain it more than I did, which is you play it and it works. <laughs> because I don't know how it worked. I just know that I fucking loved it. I hope they do another beta soon. I'm so... <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, I honestly can't wait to get into Strife. I saw, um, what is his name, Nagora Yuki? Yeah. I, I saw his that trailer. That fucking range. That's, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just, he looks really fun to play. He reminds me immediately of the Blaz Blue character, who's, a, who's like a cyber samurai. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember his name, but I know who you're talking about. It, it really felt to me immediately like, we're bringing that character over to Guilty Gear with its own sense of style. So, I, I appreciate it. I love how they showed Leo, and I was like, oh yes, fucking good, I love Leo. But the thing about Leo, he got the big ass arm sword things. So, in a closed, smaller stage setting like Strive has compared to XR, poking is a big deal. And then after Leo's trailer, they're like, now, here's this guy. He's got a sword the size of the screen. <laughs> so, oh, fuck. Leo's fucked already, I think. <laughs> yeah. God, I'm fucking excited for Strive. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be an interesting game field discussion to have once we figure out why that feels so good. <laughs> Yeah, once we play it more. Back on the topic of just things that are interactable in your environment. I really like in Crash Bandicoot. Th this is this is absolutely nothing to do with anything we've talked about so far. <laughs> but I like in Crash Bandicoot when you jump on a box, it goes boing. <laughs> it sure do. <laughs> And there are some boxes that when you jump on them, they go boing, 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 boing. You know, that sounds like... I see, like, the funny in what you're saying, but I also completely get where you're coming from. <laughs> it sure do boing, and it feel good. Because when you jump on a box in Crash Bandicoot, the, the ones that don't break immediately, they're, like, their pitch, like, slowly gets higher, and you bounce, like, slightly higher every time. Oh. And it's like, this is good! The, the sound effects in Crash Bandicoot are so good, too. Because I just thought about, like, when you get the, uh... What the fuck are they called? The, the fruits? Yeah, uh, they make that weird, satisfying slurp noise. <laughs> I can't describe it in any other way than, like, a weird slurp. But it sure is satisfying. <laughs> Crash Bandicoot has such a... It's such a really good example of how sound and movement combines to create one very specific game feel yeah <laughs> were you uh were you sticking those fruits crash that's what i want to know i want to talk about ratchet and clank a little bit Go because it's it. it's another one of those box games <laughs> yeah and i man people forever were like if you put crates in your game you are bankrupt for creativity i don't like have you played a video game <laughs> Have you not seen a box just places? Like, have you? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's such a huge pet peeve is like a box anywhere opens your mind to so many creative possibilities. Have you ever seen a cat and a box in the same room? They, they immediately go for that box and they're like, something in my brain is telling me to use this box in a certain specific way. Boxes are like the one specific thing I could see probably just about anywhere and not question it if i just saw a box in someone's yard or out in a park i'd think someone was doing something with a box okay <laughs> yeah it's just it's just a default container there's nothing wrong with it's using such a boxes. weird thing to complain about <laughs> there's nothing wrong with putting boxes in your video games in ratchet and clank dude sometimes you go into an area you haven't broke any boxes yet and the fucking boxes form to like make a ladder that goes to like a secret area if you don't immediately give in to the impulse and fucking break them all yeah second note those boxes are filled with cold hard bolts 
And bolts make the best sound effect when you pick them up. Oh, yeah, I think I kind of remember it. Um, I've only played, like, two Ratchet and Clanks. And I think one of them was up your arsenal. It's just really clanky. I hate to say clanky. Really, like, <laughs> clinky, clanky, sort of, like, it sounds, tinny sounding. It sounds like if you were putting a bolt in a bag of bolts, almost. It's like a collecting it feel. Yes, it sounds like you are almost collecting coins, but really thick, meaty coins. <laughs> And that's, that's good. That's, an, that's another one of those small things where it's just, you add a sound effect that is a little decent and boom, your entire, the enti- the feel of your entire game has changed. That's a job I've always kind of like admired. I could see myself really enjoying being a sound designer for sound effects because I've seen studios where they do that kind of thing and they just have like random shit for tools to figure out, okay, what's the best sound effect for this thing? That sounds so fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being a Foley artist would be crazy amounts of fun. God forbid you're messing around with a watermelon and you get some electrical equipment wet, though. <laughs> uh, just think of all, like, the meaty plaps and just sound effects you could just make with things. <sighs> I'm going to go off on a, a tangent about furry porn here for a minute. That's since fine. We're on... I was about to go to the same place. <laughs> <laughs> so, man, people use the same fucking clapping sound... Or just meaty plap sound in everything. Yeah. What's wrong with you people? There's so many sound effects out there for just weird meat slaps. Go find them. Go use them. Experiment a little bit. Don't just grab one sound effect and be like, plap, plap, plap. It's boring. Yeah. Find the perfect plap for that specific <laughs> plap motion. <laughs> I've always thought, because I mean, whenever I do make an animation with sound, because that's just the inevitable, like, I have 4,000 followers on Twitter, I'm a not safe for work furry artist, someday I'm, (laughs) you stay out of (laughs) these, someday I'm going to make an animation, and I really would much prefer I put sound in it, and when I do that, I'm going to go, like, the full sound design aspect on it, I'm going to be like, okay, I need a mic, and I need some meat. (laughs) Yeah. Give me, like, a fleshlight and a steak. (laughs) (laughs) Two bags of ground beef, what do we do? We cover them in oil, and we throw them at each other near a microphone. (laughs) (laughs) We want to go with me! (laughs) I'm going to have to censor that. (laughs) That's fine. I was thinking... I I always think about how, like, every podcast I listen to, they always have at least one... Let's cut that. (laughs) 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 We kind of got off tangent, but on tangent kind of at the same time. And it's because game feel is so much more vague than I kind of thought when I suggested it for the topic. But I think it also kind of fits because... People had probably better get used to us going off on tangents if they're going to be listening to yeah, this. That's gonna be a, that's going to be a pretty constant thing. Because, man, I'm looking at my shelf of video games right now, and I'm like, which one has good game feel? Uh, what do I talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, but Monster Hunter World, I see it up there. And I'm thinking about how Monster Hunter has such specific wind-up and cool-down animations for moves. And you have to actually adapt to that. That's something I thought about recently is it's technically a restriction, but it can completely contribute to really good game feel. Yeah, this is kind of on the on the same topic as uh, we were talking the other day about Resident Evil yeah. and how like the tank controls technically are bad and outdated, but do contribute to a certain very specific type of feel. Now, my opinion is that, uh, and I stated it in my Resident Evil 4 video, it's bad and outdated then and it continues to be so now but if you are going for something that is an homage to their original resident evil games sure put in tank controls because the people who understand your homage are going to get that the controls are part of the homage i did also say you should at least put in the option and at least (laughs) balance the game around modern controls also (laughs) Because not everybody's going to want to play your game like that, because it kind of doesn't feel good. Yeah, I respect tank controls now that I have seen them in these scenes they're supposed to be used in. 
I respect that they 200% create this tense, difficult, survivor-like aspect of it. But that only shines through in those moments where it melds with the horror. Otherwise, I was thinking back to the first time I played Resident Evil 1. Uh, one of my friends was like, here, just play it. I know you're not going to like the tank controls, but just play it. I fucking hated the tank controls, and I stopped playing. <laughs> but that's because the first thing you do with these tank controls in this game, you get, like, so far into the game until you actually see a zombie. Until then, you're fucking navigating this mansion and around furniture with these horrible fucking controls. Yeah. <laughs> and it does not complement exploration. It complements tension. I, ugh. Controls that get stuck on furniture is one of my most hated game feel kind of negativities. If I'm stuck, if I have to, like, keep wiggling my way around an obstacle, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. Resident Evil 5 had a, had a had tank controls, but it was also designed in a way where there weren't just obstacles in the middle of things, and you would still get caught on the corners of shit. Tank controls from a third-person perspective are also so much better. Yeah, that is also true. I, for the longest time, didn't even recognize them as tank controls because just that camera angle <laughs> kind of makes such a huge difference. It suddenly feels like, okay, but left turns left, right turns right. That makes sense. But when you're looking from like an overhead view and you got to think about, okay... I have to turn left to make my character turn to this point, face the thing I need to go towards, and then press forward. That sucks. There's like three or four different mental steps you gotta make. Yeah. I, I play a lot of mech games. So I've played Mech Warrior Online, played Mech Warrior 5, I've played Battletech, Gun Griffin, a Hawken, Armored Core, every Armored Core game. So I understand bad controls on purpose for a mech game, and when that is okay, and when that is terribly, terribly wrong. Disclaimer, my favorite game in the series is Armored Core 4, which does not have shitty controls <laughs> at all. <laughs> I swear, <laughs> it doesn't. I, and can't, then, I can't comment on it. <laughs> and then Armored Core 5 immediately goes back to shit controls on purpose. And it feels wrong. It feels weird. It doesn't feel like I'm piloting a mech. It's big. It's clunky. It's gonna be awkward. It doesn't feel like that. Yeah. I love the Armored Core series, but I, I really have to get this one off my chest. Armored Core 5 takes a step backwards because the Armored Core series always sort of had a design around your mech moves in a very particular fashion because you are restricted to its weight, its particular turning speed, how wide the sight range is on your weapons, stuff like that. And something like Armored Core 4 does that very well, where the second you are testing your mech, you can feel all those different tiny little nuances. And in Armored Core 5, you have always just a big heavy mech. <laughs> And it's, it's not the good kind of awkward that Armored Core 1 through 3 are. And it's not the... Chonky. Yeah, chonky. And it's not the near perfection that Armored Core 4 achieves with it being completely different, yet somewhat the same with the same concepts. It just, it throws all that out the window and it's like all mechs now just feel the same. Ah, uh, yeah. You. That's the way that I haven't played 5, so... <laughs> yeah. It's very homogenized. That's weird to me because... Yeah. The Armored Core series always did a very good job of taking a bunch of weird mech designs, putting them in the same game, and making them all very different. I haven't gotten there myself because any iteration of old games with bad controls I've played have been like Monster Hunter World or a more modern iteration of games. But like, I've always wondered why classic fandoms defend horrible control schemes and the claw. I don't, I didn't get the claw. But thinking about it from a standpoint of it's a weird, funky thing that you do to make the game feel happen the way it's supposed to. Those people have experienced the game feel the way I haven't because I <laughs> didn't. I refused to do the claw and then it sucked. And I was like, no, nah, <laughs> don't like this game. <laughs> <clears throat> so when people are like, oh, it's gotten simpler, I hate it. I could kind of get it because you took time to learn the claw. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, I do understand if you take the time to learn how to play a certain specific way, you feel a lot of pride in that. Looking at any fucking stat screen in any RPG, you will start getting a sense of pride from learning how all of the different stats coalesce together, which stats are more important, which ones aren't. And just putting 100 hours in a game is supposed to feel like, yeah, I put 100 hours into this, I'm pretty good at it. So when they take away something that you spent a lot of time on, you kind of feel shit about it. Like, I, I can't believe I'm mentioning this in the very first episode we're doing, <laughs> but... Rainbow Six Vegas. <laughs> I used to be a, a pro-level tier at Rainbow Six Vegas and Rainbow Six Vegas 2. And when Siege came out, I was thrown absolutely into the garbage. Because the entire game not only has a different feel, uh, the controls are just bad on controller. <laughs> and I could, I could talk and make a whole fucking half an hour long podcast about that. But the idea that a sequel should carry over some of what its old mechanics are, there's, there's a lot of value in that. And saying that something is of the same series when it's completely different from a fundamental level in almost every way as far as feel, uh, character design, level design, meta narrative, <laughs> everything about Rainbow Six Siege is different than Rainbow Six Vegas. Do I feel that that makes it not a Rainbow Six game anymore? After playing the whole series, yes, I do, kind of. <laughs> but the devs are the ones who make that decision. Yeah, that's a tough spot to be in. Things like Monster Hunter World took the, okay, we gotta make it intuitive side of thinking because as much as people love the claw, <laughs> nobody else loves the claw. <laughs> So, from a sales perspective and from a just entry level, we would like more people to play our game, maybe, please, perspective. I can see how making it more intuitive is good. And intuitive gameplay definitely has a surface level, immediate, comfortable game feel. And I think there's definitely value to that. My recent deep dive into shitty old stuff that has good aspects about it, like all of Suda51's garbage, <laughs> has been like, oh, there's more. <laughs> yeah. It's not just black and white, good and bad. It's, this is easier, therefore it's less that you're thinking about as far as, you know, the disconnect between how many steps do I have between me and the game. <laughs> yes. A lot of people who like Monster Hunter before will criticize World quite heavily because of... Not not because of the allowances that it makes for new players, but because of all of the things that they thought weren't important anymore. In every old Monster Hunter game, and I know this is content versus game feel polish sort of thing, but every single weapon had its own unique model based on the monster that you got the parts from. And that's ridiculous. That's impressive. Yeah. From any, any developer standpoint, that's really impressive. Monster Hunter World has so little in terms of new designs and it has so little in, in terms of, of monster variety too because you mostly have brute wyverns or you know some some kind of normal wyvern it's it's always a wyvern yeah i didn't get super deep into world i did beat most of the campaign and i think you walked me through to a pretty high level yeah i remember that it just felt like you were fighting the same three monsters <laughs> yeah Monster Hunter World didn't solve any of its problems with its expansion. There, I don't think there were any new monster types as far as, like, not breeds, obviously, but just sort of that, that overarching type. Like, there wasn't a bug or something I could fight, like a, a giant one. There was just sort of more brute wyverns. And the Elder Gods are cool. You get T-Rex, Dragon, the Vor one, and then a few others. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's bird wyverns. I'd have to look it up, but it's like, there's like four types of monsters and then the elder gods or elder dragons. 
Pfft, elder gods. <laughs> then there's the elder dragons, and Kirin is, again, kind of the only unique elder dragon as far as, like, move sets and model and animation design and all that sort of stuff. Not to say that there aren't a bunch of details unique to each monster, but just sort of the overarching type they've designed the game around. It feels kind of empty. It is a game with a lot of variety, but it's like surface level variety. It's like, we can make this look cool, but we're not going to spend the time on that on the player end. We're not going to spend time making sure our stats scale correctly from single player to multiplayer, from early game to late game. Monster Hunter World misses a lot of that that the earlier Monster Hunter games had. Yeah. And I think it probably worked, but a lot of the meat was in the beginning, and that was just to, like, entice people who hadn't. And then there was a lot of meat for people who were going to play it anyway with multiplayer with friends, because it's the first time it's been... It has never been easier than this. <laughs> yeah, it's still not easy, but it has never been easier. <laughs> well, I guess the the whole thing that brought up Monster Hunter World is also exactly why people love Dark Souls and all of the Souls series is because you got really <laughs> unique controls. Yeah. And your job is to adapt around them or die. <laughs> yes. When I first played Demon Souls, I was like... This is an extremely good game concept built around terribly <laughs> polished RPG mechanics that were just, they were scaling improperly and you couldn't pick up a second armor set because if you were wearing heavy armor already, fat chance picking up more armor, you just couldn't carry it. <laughs> and then you would leave the area and then it would be deleted forever and you could never get it. So if you just didn't know it was there to pick up, Best fucking hope you enjoy that heavy armor. <laughs> yeah, Demon Souls was like, that was like, you need an encyclopedic fucking brain to begin playing Demon Souls. And then Dark Souls was like, Demon Souls, but without some of the shitty restrictions. Yeah, and all the Demon Souls players got that big brain. <laughs> <laughs> God, I don't know about that. <laughs> I would say they're, uh... They're masochists who like RPGs too much. I am looking forward to trying the remaster because I remember when you were showing me Demon's Souls in our first apartment in like 2012 on PS3. And I remember how it kind of looked kind of bad back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it had some jank to it. There were Xbox 360 games and PS3 games that looked like PS2 games that had gotten pooped out and onto the next generation. Yeah. <laughs> they were just like, oh, it's the new generation. Uh, put it in the engine and let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really did look like that. That sounds like a FromSoft kind of thing, too. Just like, well, we, we didn't prepare for the next generation. We got a game almost ready. Let's just slap it. <laughs> Can you believe that Demon Souls and Dark Souls 2 are on the same console? Just looking at them. Oh, God, you're right. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Oh, that Dark Souls money really did make some changes, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. From Software is completely different than how they were when they made Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, and Armored Core 4 and 4 Answer. Like, just, just a completely different company now. Yeah, it, realizing that and, like, they've been a little bit of that weird deep dive I did recently along with the Suda51 stuff where I just really like old jank for some reason right now. <laughs> It feels like that's an entire era I missed out on because we ain't getting that back. <laughs> no, we're really not. When I was a young man, my father bought me 300 PS2 games because I was rich and spoiled. And I also had an Xbox and I also had a GameCube each with 100 games on them. And we had a massive video game cabinet that I wish I still had today because it would be not only worth a lot more money... <laughs> But because I want to play like half of that shit, I don't even remember the name of. I was going through a game every like two days. Thinking about comparing our childhoods for a moment, but I've also thought about you've been on a fucking roller coaster ride because here we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I I played Sonic Adventure 2 a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I've really had, like, the, the grand spectacle of, I can play a game and move on. Back when people were talking about Steam sale for the first time, and they were like, I've got 300, 600 games on Steam, and I don't know what to play. Well, when I was a kid, I had 300 to 500 games, and I would literally just go down the list. Yeah. 
I would play through the whole thing and then buy another one. And if I ever wanted to replay an old game, I'd play it. But man, but if it wasn't just really play a game, beat it, buy a new one. Play a game, beat it, buy a new one. Over and over and over and over. Shit, you probably could have played like a good majority of From Software's back catalog and not even realized it. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were quite a few games that were like really popular now that people talk about all the time. I remember have playing them. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having had played them when I was a kid and because I had played another game that was vaguely similar or better than it and not well known and just being like, eh, this is nothing special. And then it gets popular years later and people talk about why they like it and I'm like, I don't get it. Well, I appreciate your childhood and game diversity because uh, you came along and I had played a lot of Sonic Adventure 2 so all I knew was that and then you were like, here's good game. <laughs> and I, from realistic real perspective Sonic Adventure 2 decent game but being a Sonic fan and then having someone come along and be like you, you haven't played games <laughs> that, <laughs> that, yeah. that helped a lot <laughs> here's Metal Gear Solid and Devil May Cry and I really like Ratchet and Clank maybe you didn't latch on to Ratchet and Clank because nobody does because nobody <laughs> loves me <laughs> you still latched on to Devil May Cry and Metal Gear and that's something. Fucking Metal Gear. I really took, like, the surface level of Metal Gear away from it first. Because, uh, <laughs> it was guns and sneaking cool. And that was, like, my appreciation of Metal Gear for a while. <laughs> Getting back around into old topic, that's not a bad thing. Because the devs were still like, hey, if you're stupid, <laughs> here's guns and sneaking is cool. <laughs> yeah, it really is like that. I realized that now because I've been a fan of Metal Gear for a while and at a certain point one of the things that Kojima and his team were trying to get across is once you understand Metal Gear you kind of hate Metal Gear a little bit just a twinge I love Metal Gear but I kind of hate it a little bit too yeah I was one of those people where when I first thought about what Metal Gear was I was like why are the controls kind of jank and why do I love this game so much and why is it weird and why do I love that it's it's weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Metal Gear Solid 2 is awful and you can't convince me otherwise. I have things that I like about it. I would have to replay it, tell you whether or not I think it's a good game. <laughs> I honestly think it's it's abysmal. It's fine that the entire game takes place in one setting. It's fine that it doesn't have that long of a runtime. It's fine that Raiden's kind of an oblivious, kind of stupid protagonist. Yeah. All of those things are fine. What's not fine is the level designs are extremely samey. That if you do get spotted, it's incredibly hard to do anything about it. I do remember that shit. I remember, well, really anything else in the series. You kind of have a, okay, if I get spotted, here's what I can do. In two, it's it's, if you get spotted, it's shoot time. <laughs> yeah, you're just you're just shit out of luck. And some people will go, oh, that's just because Raiden isn't as good as Snake. No, it's because Metal Gear Solid 2 isn't as good as Metal Gear Solid 1 or 3 or 4 or 5. I think there's a whole lot about Metal Gear Solid 2 that is a major, like, meta narrative. He's got a point behind it kind of thing. I don't think that's one of them. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I think that's just bad design. <laughs> yes. Because how can you come off of the back of... Of Metal Gear Solid 1, make Metal Gear Solid 2, and then be happy with it. I think that, that and he was probably tired of death threats were partially why Metal Gear Solid 3 was so good. <laughs> Man, I would hate to, like, be a Kojima level popularity i think a little bit i'd kind of love it for the money but i hate it for the uh whoops you said something death threat time <laughs> yeah just look can we just say like at a base level if you ever send an artist or a developer or anybody for any reason a death threat you are the one who should die. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of a piece of shit if you're throwing death threats at uh, developers, especially if it's like, uh-oh, you 
made a decision I don't like. If it's like a developer that made a game about glorifying Nazis or some shit, okay, throw some death threats. But who? Nobody has done that. <laughs> yeah, and before anybody fucking says anything, no, those Nazi games where you kill Nazis are not glorifying Nazis. It's glorifying killing Nazis. Are we the baddies? <laughs> Are we the baddies? <laughs> we started talking about Metal Gear and, I, and how I, it's influenced me early on. That fucking Metal Gear Solid 3 ending. Because I think, yeah, 3 was the first one I beat. The Shagohod chase. I was so hyped because that score, that music, oh, that really accompanied it really well. And then I remember beating the boss. Uh, spoilers for Metal Gear Solid 3, but it's been out for a while. <laughs> it's been out for a long time. Um, I remember just sitting there because I expected it to just be a cutscene where he shoots. I didn't. I sat there for a good like two minutes before I realized, oh no, <laughs> you have to press the button. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that was one of the first times that a game has even suggested that you could do that kind of thing to me, and I love shit like that. Yes, Metal Gear Solid 4 went way too ham on it, <laughs> but it's, it was still really cool to see. Yeah, the reason it definitely went ham on it is just because Metal Gear Solid 4 was this weird mixture of, uh, here, it's the Metal Gear you wanted, but also, I fucking hate it as the creator. <laughs> That's just the whole, like, Kojima perspective. He definitely was not happy. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that... I don't know if I care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Metal Gear Solid 4 is still my favorite one. Uh, if it were, like, the last in the series for real, it would have been a weird tonal... Okay, never mind. I just realized that 5 is the last in the series, and that is the weird tonal thing to end off on. Yeah. So, it fucked either way, I guess. It doesn't matter where you would have ended Metal Gear Solid. Even if Metal Gear Solid 5 was finished, it never would have been satisfying of a conclusion. Yeah, I don't think, considering that half the plot details were created just because Konami was like, you and your team are going to go make another Metal Gear, despite the fact that nobody wanted to make another Metal Gear. <laughs> yeah. I think from, like, 3 onward, because 3 was where he was like, okay, I'm go not he, but like, I'm trying to give his team credit, too. I've had a really bad habit of being like, Kojima did everything. That is not the way it went. Yeah, <laughs> but, it's, uh, it's not how development ever goes. Yeah, but um, 3 was the one for me where I was like, that's Metal Gear. 4 was good, I liked it, but it was definitely just Konami wants another Metal Gear and you got some ties to you know tie up at the end there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the reason I like Metal Gear Solid 4 better than Metal Gear Solid 3 is because it takes it takes just about every concept that Metal Gear has ever done and and done well and it basically ignores Metal Gear Solid 2 uh, except for Raiden being, you know, a main character who gets his arms <laughs> ripped off. Oh my god. I love that they made Raiden, like, a yeah. shitty mall ninja character. I'm so... Raiden's, like, path is one of my favorite Metal Gear things. Because it started out as he's directly just cucking the average gamer. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, it became, oh, that character you don't like? He's fucking cool now. <laughs> yeah. And if you still don't like him, well, he suffers a lot. <laughs> so you got that for you. At least he did get something back on the angry gamer mobs because he really knew how to fucking tug them along. <laughs> I actually like Snake's story in Metal Gear Solid 4, even though he's not really that old like he's reaching the end of his natural lifespan of how he's supposed to exist and that was kind of what metal gear was at the time is like it's reaching its natural lifespan of where it's supposed to be and there's this old glory mentality of like you'll never be who you were when you were young that you, you can never go back to that. And Metal Gear Solid 4 does a very good job of being like, this will never be Metal Gear Solid 1 again. Yeah. We can try. And they do try. And there's a lot of really good cutscenes in 4. I could... But sure are. <laughs> I could talk about Liquid Kissing Snake for like another 10 minutes if you want. Oh, that vamp riding fight. That gets me so horny. I hate vamp. 
I know you way. do, but... He's one of those things... I forgot he existed until you mentioned him, and I'm like, God damn it! <laughs> I, uh... I hate Kojima's horny a little bit, but I still love his horny designs in 4, because Dick Knife on Vamp was like... That was one of those things that it clicked in my brain. I was like, I love it! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Yeah, when Metal Gear Horny is pinups in lockers, it's bad. When it's girl crying on the floor covered in some weird octopus ink, that's kind of... I like that for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I love the designs of the... What the fuck are they called? The girls. The B&Bs? Yeah, the B&Bs. But I hate how, like, kind of one-dimensionally tragic they're written. And then I hate how it's weirdly... That's the fetishy part. <laughs> I hate yeah, I hate how it's presented to the player, for sure. Because I think they're all good character designs. Yeah. And their tragic pasts are all good. It's just... They need more character depth than that. They need it to not just be told to you by Drebin after the fact. <laughs> There needs to be something in the gameplay leading up to their concept. Yeah, I don't think fighting this boss that's this, like, naked lingerie woman soaked in goo crawling at you. And then you beat her and then you get a call that's like, here's why she was soaked in goo and crawling at you. Yeah. <laughs> it's I, her tragic backstory. <laughs> I honestly think, I don't know who was responsible for that, Kojima or whoever. I always blame the horror young Kojima. <laughs> yeah, but look, don't try to justify your stupid. Just let it be stupid. And if you want to add depth to something, add more depth than... This is why the horny was there. Yeah. It, it just... Don't legitimify your horny. Don't give me fucking fanfic or whatever. Yeah, I'm I'm glad we didn't get, like, a weird lore thing for Vamp's dick knife, because I can 200% see that happening, and... Oh, it I turns would... out that Vamp had his dick cut off when he was a child. <laughs> he had it hardened and turned into metal with pressure. <laughs> Nanomachines. I... <laughs> I don't like Vamp. <laughs> I don't like the story with Naomi with Vamp. I think I like, I don't like Vamp's the weird... design more than anything. Yeah, his his design's great. I think his voice actor's great. I don't like his character. <laughs> I don't like that his entire concept is just being vague. That's... <sighs> Even his, like, explanation and backstory and everything is kind of just vague. He's nanomachine vampire. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's fine, but the way he's written as just being like, I'm fancy and naked, deal with it, is just kind of, I don't know, it's, it feels lazy. Yeah. And, and let, me, let me backpedal a bit here, because earlier I said, don't legitimify your horny, and then I'm also saying vamp is lazy. Yeah. What I mean by that is, if you are giving the same... Same treatment of backstory to your horny B&B characters. And then you're just like, vamp nano machines. But you see, Kojima is not a gay. That doesn't matter. <laughs> Have you seen that tweet? No, I haven't. <laughs> he was like, he was wearing a rainbow shirt and he was like, he was specifically tweeting about, if you see me in a rainbow shirt or something, it is just because I like the colors. I am not a gay. <laughs> Fucking Kojima. <laughs> oh. What a fucking enigma. We were talking about Gamefield at one point. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a natural progression that we get to Metal Gear eventually, because that's just one of those, like, I think the way we got into it was it was one of the first times that I realized I had, like, what game feel was. But Metal Gear did a lot right. It did a lot weird, and it did a lot wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always going to be one of those people that's like, you can like or even love a game with huge glaring flaws in it. It's exactly how I feel about Metal Gear Solid 4. Yeah. It's exactly how I feel about the entire Dark Souls series. I'm going to get hate for that. <laughs> you know, I think it's slowly becoming cool to hate Dark Souls now. It's not perfect. I don't want to get into it in this episode. Yeah. We could talk about Dark Souls on length later when we talk about difficulty in video games. 
We're about an hour in. I don't think we got any Dark Souls time. <laughs> yeah. What are games that stand out to you as having the best game? For you? Hmm. Not just Devil May Cry, not just Metal Gear Solid. You know one that will probably never be talked about again because uh, the mobile and Switch port murdered it. But the use that The World Ends With You used for the DS controls... That was hot. Oh, yeah. We we have really haven't talked about any Nintendo properties with Game Field, but we have to also get into, like, gimmicks. And it's like, is gimmicks conducive to interesting Game Feel, or is it just a selling point on the box? I think it is an entry point for a good Game Feel. It is a another avenue for good game feel it is hardly ever utilized <laughs> how many games took advantage of the wii's motion controls properly like a handful yeah and the wii was also so long ago now that i don't know if it's even fair to look at it through the lens of like is that still good design is that still good game feel is that still just is is it a gimmick now that it's not being actively used in the developer spectrum at all. Well, now, we can... It kind of is still with the... Well, the technology's there for the Switch. I haven't seen any games that have used that. Yeah. I think in Mario Odyssey, you can wiggle the remote to make him do a spin. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that Nintendo's idea of combining their console gimmicks with their handheld gimmicks panned out for them. I don't I don't think it's going to continue to because what people really do want is they want a console that can also go anywhere and the Switch does that what they don't want is a console with shittily made controllers that can't do the basic functions even if they have all these other bells and whistles if your sticks drift your console failed I think uh a good subject for next episode because I I know we both got a lot to say about it, is uh, ripping the shit out of Nintendo. <laughs> yeah, that'll be its own episode. Too. I love Nintendo, but we can rip the shit out of Nintendo too. <laughs> Absolutely. But just as far as game feel in Nintendo games, certain games do it really well. Certain games are extremely gimmicky. I think Splatoon has amazing game feel. Yeah. I think that was one of the ones that someone who knew what they were doing, added gyro controls. <laughs> that made the world realize, oh, that's viable. <laughs> yeah, I'm just talking about, like, painting stuff is fun. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the ones that I played, like, once or twice. I always regretted not getting, even still. Well, I don't think anyone plays Splatoon anymore, unfortunately. It would be a really weird move to buy Splatoon 2 in 2020, I think. Yeah, for sure. They kind of leaned into the games as a service thing quite a bit. Yeah. Man, we didn't really talk about game feel a whole lot. We mostly just talked about... No, we, we like, talked about a lot of aspects about game feel. Because yeah. game feel in general... I think initially we went for uh, the concept was, you know, the direct feedback from your hands. But that's only like a portion of it, I think. Yeah, it's really hard to make one conclusive opinion about all game feel ever. But I think to me, what game feel is at a base is cause and effect. Yeah, it's, it comes down to that director mentality of uh, if you're making something... You need to be thinking directly about how is this going to make the person feel when they're doing it. You are doing something to evoke something from a player. And I think that is a really good direction to go from it. Is just thinking about, okay, I know how this is going to feel because I'm doing it. I What do I want them to feel? <laughs> so whether you're, you know, crushing a box, jumping on a box lighting sheep on fire in Spyro, painting something, whether you're using motion controls to play Cooking Mama or what, the interactive part of it, evoking any kind of response from a player, is that's, that's important. It's definitely something that is being utilized a little more for sure. Games are getting a lot bigger just as a medium. And people have known for a while now that games can do the same sort of uh, immersive thing things that movies can do because you can just put movies in games <laughs> yeah. but people are also now realizing that you can make it feel that way through immersion and through direct like interactivity and i've also noticed people combining the two sort of like the metal gear solid 3 ending where you have to shoot where it's 
a narrative consequence of your actions and you have to do it. Yeah. That is where it is absolutely the strongest, where you are doing something that you are emotionally invested in. That is always my favorite thing in games. I think uh, in another episode, we already know what we have to talk about. We have to talk about difficulty curve in video games. We have to talk about uh, ripping the shit out of Nintendo. I'm fucking coming. <laughs> And we have to talk about games as a medium uh, versus every other medium. So, like, why make a game when you can make a movie? Why make a movie when you can make a game? That kind of thing. Like, what's the point of being a game developer specifically? And while we didn't get way too in-depth about what particulars make game feel great, because we did, we did touch on it, we might have to touch on those topics... And then make a Game Feel 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Game Feel 2 Electric Boogaloo. The sequel. Yes. It's personal this time. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo, you have until the next episode to fix your online service. I'm coming. <laughs>